Hello, family. We're so glad that you tuned in for another edition of 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. I'm Jill Morricone. We're studying The Great Controversy, which is an incredible book written by Ellen White, but we're also studying The Great Controversy as we see it from heaven with Lucifer's rebellion all the way down to the earth made new, the final eradication of sin and God's way wins. We read the back of the book and we know that. Mm -hmm. This lesson, lesson two, is the central issue, love or selfishness. If you want a copy of our notes, we email them every week. And if you've already subscribed, you don't have to subscribe again. But if this is the first time you're hearing about it, you can email us at ssp at 3abn.org. That's ssp at 3abn.org. And we'd love to give you a copy of the notes just as we prepare them. I want to introduce my family, your family today. To my left, Pastor John Loma King. Glad you're here. Yes, this is an exciting quarterly, the great controversy. So I'm glad to be a part of the panel. Amen. And what are you studying on your day? On my well, mine is Christians Providentially Preserved. Amen. In the middle, Ryan Day. Amen. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled Faithful Amid Persecution. Wonderful. To your left, uh, Pastor John Denzi. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here. I have a very important lesson for Wednesday, Caring for the Community. Mm. Last but not least, Professor Daniel Perrin. Thank you. I've got Thursday's lesson, A Legacy of Love. Mm, amen. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And Daniel, would you pray for us? Our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, only by your grace can we understand the character of God. And only by your grace can we have that implanted in us to be like you. Lord, as we study today, uh, we open up our hearts and we ask you to fill us, teach our minds, teach us to live and to love like you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The central issue, love or selfishness? Ryan asked a question as we started last week's lesson, which we're going to start this week's lesson with. Where is God in pain? Where is God in the midst of suffering? If you've ever studied the Holocaust, which occurred not that long ago, you discover that six million Jews were killed, murdered during that time. One million alone in the concentration camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau. One million people in just a short span of time. Where is God in the midst of pain? This week, we're going to look a little bit at the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And we'll see the starvation that took place with the people there when it was under siege. And then the people who were killed by the general when he came in. Where is God in the midst of that pain? We'll also discover that not one Christian lost their life during that siege. We're going to look at the persecution of the early Christian church, and we'll discover that some of those Christians were martyred for their faith. They were not spared. We see how the gospel is going to be spread through that persecution and the love that the early Christian church had for others and for God that carried them through some very painful and difficult times. We're going to discover this week the power of love. Jesus' love for his people, even though they rejected him. We're going to see that under persecution, it didn't deter God's people because they loved him supremely. And we'll see the early Christian church's love for other people for others in the church and those who were not even in the church. Our memory text is Isaiah 41, verse 10, and you probably know this verse. Isaiah 41, 10, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will help you, I will strengthen you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. On Sunday's lesson, we look at a broken-hearted Savior. And we're going to see the love of God for his people who had rejected him. We're going to look at two passages. Um, the, this is the triumphal entry. This is Passover week right before the crucifixion. And we're going to go to Luke 19 first. So turn with me to Luke 19. We're also going to look at it from Matthew 23. 
Luke 19, and we see Jesus on this young male donkey beginning the descent on the Mount of Olives, and there's people waving palm branches and singing, Hosanna to the King. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. And they're uh, giving him accolades and thinking, oh, wow, look, Jesus is here, the Messiah. Now they had no concept of his true mission and that he's about ready to be crucified. Now in the midst of all this, we see in Luke 19, verse 41, as he, that's Jesus, drew near. He saw the city and he rejoiced. Is that what it says? Mm -hmm. He wept over it. Now he's not weeping because of his coming crucifixion. He's not weeping for himself. He's sad because his own people, God's chosen people, the people he came to save, they're going to reject him and they're going to go their own way. It's interesting to me, if you read the Old Testament, Israel is likened to a vine. You can find that in several different mm -hmm. passages. We found this in Psalm verse 80, where God says, you've brought a vine out of Egypt. In other words, Israel, God's chosen people were pulled out of a land of oppression and they were brought into this land of milk and honey. He wanted to care for his people. And what happened? Jeremiah 2 verse 21 tells us what happened to that vine. You planted a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then? Have you turned before me into a degenerate plant of an alien vine? Hmm. God's people disobeyed him. God's people had turned away from him. You could say the vineyard, it went bad. Wow. You also see in Isaiah 5, God planting the vineyard and watering it and wanting to take care of his people. And time and time again, them turning their back on God. So when God, when Jesus is here looking over the city, he sees the impending destruction of Jerusalem coming in AD 70. He sees that the people, his people, God's chosen people are going to reject him and are turning their back as a nation against him. Now that doesn't mean individual people can't be saved. Of course they can, but as a nation turning their back on him. John 1 11, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Let's keep reading. We're in uh, Luke 19, verse 42. He wept over the city saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Mm -hmm. He brought the gospel to them and they refused him. For days will come upon you when your enemies, this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem coming, will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave you in one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Hmm. We see the parallel passage from Matthew, and I want to turn there now. We're going to Matthew chapter 23. We see this parallel passage. Jesus, again, weeping over his people. And I see in my mind's eye, as I read this passage, three stages, Pastor John, for the Jerusalem and Israel in this passage. Number one, they rejected counsel in the past. Mm -hmm. We're in Matthew 23. Verse 37, they rejected counsel in the past. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. God's people have been stiff-necked and stubborn. Hey. There's a five-fold cycle of obedience as we look at the sins in the past and how the people had refused to turn to God. If you look at Nehemiah chapter 9, you see this five-fold cycle of disobedience. We won't turn there, but you can study it. And it cycles through at least three times in Nehemiah chapter 9. You see the people disobeyed. And whatever it says in the Word of God, sometimes it says they're stiff-necked. Sometimes it says they disobeyed. Sometimes they turned away from Him. They went to idols. That's step number one. Number two comes judgment. God sends judgment on His people. Why? Because He wants them to repent. He wants them to turn back to Him in obedience because mm -hmm. He's a God of love. 
and he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So after judgment comes repentance, and you see this happen with the children of Israel. The nations around came in against them, and they were oppressed, and then they cried out to God in their time of need. They repented, and the last two, mercy and deliverance went forth. God showed mercy. He forgave them. He cleansed them, and he delivered them from their enemies. Right. And we see this happen over and over, but as soon as the land had rest, the Word of God says, as soon as things got easy and pleasant, they disobeyed again and they turned their back on God again. He sent judgment again. One of the stronger judgments would be, of course, the Babylonian captivity. Seventy years they were oppressed, seventy years in a foreign country and nation. Why? Because they had turned their back on God. But this judgment was not a judgment to annihilate them. It was a corrective discipline. Right. He wanted to show mercy. He wanted to deliver them. And after the 70 years, they were delivered. But we get down to Jesus' time. And he's saying here, number one, you rejected my counsel in the past. How many times in the past did the prophets come to you and you killed them? You stoned them you would not repent. And now we see number two, they refused Christ's entreaty today. It's not just the past, the present they refused him. How often, we're in Matthew 23, 37, I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Hmm. <sighs> him coming in person didn't change their minds. The prophets came and they refused. They repented in pockets, and then they turned again to disobedience. Him coming in person, they refused. They're about ready to kill him. We come to number three, retribution is coming. Judgment is coming. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. The divine protection would be removed. The people would suffer terribly. Tens of thousands would die as the Roman general Titus led the armies against the city. Men and women and little children would be slaughtered. So you might say, where is God? His heart was broken. His eyes were filled with tears. For centuries he had pleaded with his people. The lesson has this statement I love. By their rebellion against his loving kindness, they forfeited divine protection. God does not always intervene to limit the results of people's choices. Mm -hmm. And here we see in a, in a case for those people, the nation of Israel coming soon in AD 70, we see the divine protection being removed and the end results of the choices that they had made. Isaiah 5 verse 4, God speaking, what more could I have done to my vineyard that I haven't done already. So to me, when we look at the destruction of Jerusalem, we see a picture, as it were, of what's gonna happen at the end of time. God bears long with his people and he loves us, but at some point, when all will have made their choice, either for or against God, that divine protection will be removed and we see judgment as a result. While there is yet time, choose love. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jill, for laying such a wonderful foundation. I am on Monday entitled Christians Providentially Preserved. My wife and I fly quite a bit and we have more than a million miles, I think over the years, I kind of extended out to about the two million mark, but something that came to my mind, whenever we take off, it doesn't matter what the airline is. It could be very, very small, local or a very extensive airline, they always talk about emergency measures because they've said emergency measures becomes the single most important focus in times of tragedy. And the NTSB always looks for the black box to find out the reason why things went so tragically wrong. Well, we look at the world today and we look at the decline of humanity and we could look at God's black book to find out the reasons why things went so tragically wrong and it will always give us information describing exactly what happened in the fall of humanity. The good news is in the fall of humanity, we are still providentially preserved by Christ who understands our weaknesses, our frailties. And we find in Psalm 46 and verse one to three, this, this uh, emergency measure that we can always know is there. In the tailspin of life, 
by God's grace, we can always correct our attitude. And that's really flight language. But notice what the Bible says in Psalm 46, verses 1 to 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. He's saying, but I'm still there. He's my ever-present help in time of need. I read a story recently, a very tragic story of a lady who became a very well-known YouTuber. She would always chronicle her flights that she took. And uh, more recently, just about a year ago, she met in a tragic accident that took her life and her father's life. Mm -hmm. And uh, they tried to analyze so many pilots, so many people that are in the aviation industry decided to analyze because she put GoPro cameras in the cockpit and those cameras were recovered to see exactly what she did wrong. They said she was more interested, and this is not a judgment call, but this is what they had concluded. She was very uh, concerned in popularity, but was not familiar with her plane and made judgment calls in critical moments that ultimately ended in the tragedy of her life and her father's life. And sometimes I think about how much we are more concerned about being familiar, becoming familiar with God's instrument than the popularity that it brings. And as Lord is in essence saying to us, focus on all of the things I've made available to you that in your walk with me, you can have a life that is safe. And so when we think about living from the day-to-day, -day, which is where we all live, the day-to-day -day of your life, whatever decisions you're making, there is no need to fear if you simply, and I like the way that pilots have told me this, I was sitting next to a pilot that had flown for more than 32 years and come to find out we're different uh, belief systems, but he said something significant. I said, how well do you know the Boeing 777? He says, it doesn't matter how well I know it, I always use my flight checklist. Mm. And you know, there are Christians that live from day to day. They don't use their checklist. Mm. They don't look at their lives through the window of God's word. And pilots and passengers have this unbroken commitment by the NTSB. Don't leave the ground until you have gone through the checklist. And there's a co-pilot to make sure that the pilot and the co-pilot live by the checklist. Mm -hmm. How many of you are living by the checklist, by God's checklist? If you are, you can embrace this promise, Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Fear not. For I am with you, be not dismay, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right arm. So I have four actual observations about what happens when we look at God's providential pres preservation of every one of, us on a, every one of us on a daily basis. The first one is God is sovereign. God rules over the plotting of man against his children. God rules over the plotting of the enemy against his children. And in all situations, God has the final say. God determines the outcome based on his foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. What is foreknowledge? Based on knowledge. How do you compare the two? If you stood on the corner of a tall building and you saw two cars streaming toward the intersection and there was no stop sign, you know you have foreknowledge that something tragic is about to happen. You haven't programmed it. You can't prevent it, but you have the foreknowledge. God sees us in the realm and the flow of life, and he knows based on the decisions we make, based on the intersections of our lives, based on the unseen enemy, he knows what's going to take place and he preempts it by his goodness. And I can't tell you how many times my wife and I have said, these two words, but God. Mm. It could have been much worse, but yes, God. Right. And sometimes God allows the lesser evil to prevent the greater evil. So God is sovereign. What does he say in Luke 8 and verse 17? Here's God's sovereignty. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. God sees it all. He's never in the dark. Also Psalm 62 and verse 6. David says, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. That's the providential promise. If you trust in God, there's nobody that can move you. Nobody, nobody financially, economically, socially, spiritually, in no capacity of your life can you be moved when God is your rock. First, God is sovereign. Secondly, God is preemptive. Nothing passes to God's children without God's permission. 
People ask, why did that happen? Let me share a quotation with you, and I'll come back to the other two points. Because many of us want to be Christians, but sometimes we wonder why do things happen. And in Ministry of Healing, page 470 and 471, this is an amazing quote. I'll try to get through it in the time I have. Speaking about us, they pray for Christ-likeness of character, for a fitness for the Lord's work, and they are placed in circumstances that seem to call forth all the evil of their nature. How does that happen? Faults are revealed of which they did not even suspect the existence. And like Israel of old, they question, if God is leading us, why do all these things come to us? But here's what Ellen White says. It is because God is leading them that these things come upon them. Trials and obstacles are the Lord's chosen methods of discipline and his appointed conditions of success. He who reads the hearts of men knows their character better than they themselves know them. He sees that some have powers and susceptibilities which, rightly directed, might be used in the advancement of his work. But listen to this. In his providence, he brings these persons that he can use into different positions and varied circumstances that they may discover in their character the defects which had been concealed from their own knowledge. That's God's foreknowledge. He then gives them opportunity to correct these defects and to fit themselves for his service. Often he permits the fires of affliction to assail them that they may be purified. God's foreknowledge. He says, you can be better than that. I need to get you into a furnace today. But he doesn't let you get consumed there. He purifies you there. Right. So the furnace of affliction is not for consummation, but for purification, which now takes us to the third point. God is our intermediary. I pointed out God is preemptive. Romans 8, 28, we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. How many things? All. all things. It doesn't matter. God never allows anything to come unless he knows it's going to be for our growth. God is also our intermediary. Nothing gets between God and his children. I love the prayer that was prayed in Genesis 31, verse 49. May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from another. There is never a time that God is not watching between you and your co-workers, between you and your spouse, between you and your children. But here's the key. When you put God first and foremost and front and center in your life, you're not looking for the, the oxygen mask. You know where it is. You're not looking for the flotation vest. You've been told where it is. When you know where God's word is on a day-by-day -day basis, in emergencies, there really is no crisis because he is always present. Then not, not, not only that, if you're not even awake, God is our sentinel. God keeps watch over his children. Psalm 34, verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but what is God's part? But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Are you struggling and wondering when God is going to deliver you? Don't put God on the timetable. The promise is not time sensitive. It is it is focused on the assurance, the blessed assurance that comes only through divine intervention. He will deliver you. Let God choose the timing. In Psalms 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. So what's the point? God is sovereign and overrules events on earth for the ultimate accomplishment of his divine purpose. Secondly, Although at times God alters his original plans based on our human choices, his ultimate plan for this planet will be fulfilled. Thirdly, there will be times when the people of God experience hardship, persecution, imprisonment, and death itself for the cause of Christ. But finally, but even in the most challenging of times with Satan's most vicious attacks, God sustains and preserves his church. Trust God. He is always providentially delivering you. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John. God is always love. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the 3 ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. 
Welcome back to our study on the central issue, love or selfishness. We're going to turn it over to Ryan Day on Tuesday's lesson. Amen. I'm Ryan Day. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled Faith Amid Persecution. And I'm so excited that I got this lesson because it was very encouraging just to revisit the power of what the gospel can do in people's lives to make them so faithful even through the persecution that not might come, not could come, but as the Bible says, will absolutely come. And it's, it's important that we understand where we stand in our faith. Are we with Christ even through the difficulties, even through the challenges? Or are we going to let those persecutions discourage us and even potentially move us, shift us, or draw us away from the faith? Uh, we're going to jump into the book of Acts because it's very encouraging to see how amazingly this church just explodes, uh, not just in numbers, but uh, of course the, the faith is spreading rapidly like fire in the early church age here, especially from the days of Pentecost onward. So I'm in Acts chapter 2 verse 41. We get a glimpse of just how powerful the movement of God was in this early church. Acts 2, I'm going to read verse 41. It says, Then those who gladly received His word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Praise God. <laughs> That's amazing. And, and, uh, and this continues on. Next chapter, Acts chapter 4, verse 4, and we're going to read verse 31. Notice what it says. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And when they had prayed, the place where, uh, where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So they're on fire. They're experiencing Christ. They understand who He is and they understand the, the wonderful life-changing uh, aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You could see the church is exploding here. Acts chapter 5, next chapter. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. It says, And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And so the church is growing. The gospel is moving. People are being changed. Their lives being transformed by the gospel of Jesus. And of course, by the time you get to Acts chapter 7, we're not going to read anything from there. Uh, but Acts chapter 7, we see that Stephen is in the, in the street preaching. He's reminding the leaders of Israel. He's eventually taken before the Sanhedrin and he's reminding them of what they've done and how they rejected the Messiah and how their time of probation is coming to a close. And what do they do? Instead of receiving the message, instead of receiving the gospel, they plug their ears, they take him outside the city, they stone him. And we know there that it says that they laid their coats, those who stoned him, at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, notice when we get to Acts chapter 8, what is happening here, because now Saul has been drafted, I guess you could say, to go wreak havoc. And I'm using the Bible's words here, havoc on these believers. And notice the response of the believers. That's the whole point of this lesson. Many people would run and, and go hide. And similar to what the disciples did when, uh, when Jesus was crucified, they all ran and hid because they were for fear of the Jews finding them and doing the same to them. They hid. But now this, this Pentecostal uh, movement, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit has, has now revived or awakened a spirit within them that they're not fearful of what's going to happen to them. They are, they are locked in on Christ. And so notice, we're going to start in verse 3 here, Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. It says, as Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, notice here, notice the response. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Notice they didn't scatter and go high. They went and continued to preach the word. And then, and of course, the results of this, uh, verse 8, it says, And there was great joy in the city. So what was the response of Saul's persecution? Well, they might have scattered, but they continued to preach the word. And again, amid all of this persecution, you see the faith of these people because they're joyful to continue to be able to preach the word. Now, Saul would have a very similar uh, uh, situation happen to him because he's eventually going to be converted in the next chapter, chapter 9, on his way to Damascus, he's blinded and he realizes who his Lord really is. And uh, of course, call, Paul is called, now Saul becomes Paul, and he's called to now take this gospel, the gospel that he once was persecuting, and the people of the gospel that he was once persecuting. Now he's become one of them, and he is commissioned to go take this gospel to all of those people in Jerusalem who will believe, and even the Gentiles. And Paul gives us his story over his life, all that he went through 
And let me tell you something, this brother who once persecuted, he tells the story of how he also amid uh, all of this persecution kept the faith. You get a glimpse of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 22 to 28. I'm going to begin reading partway, just a few words into verse 23 of 2 Corinthians 11. And Paul gives us a list here. I mean, this list is just amazing about the persecutions he went through. Uh, and many of us read this, this, this and think, man, if I went through that, how would I respond? Notice the faith of Paul. He says, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. That was five times, five different occasions he received that. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. At night and a day, I've been, I've been in the deep and journeys often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils of among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And notice it says here, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? Goes, Through all of this, what comes to my mind? What is on my mind? The fear of what's going to happen next, the fear of all that's happening that has happened to me and what might happen to me after this. He says, what comes to me, what comes upon me daily? He says, my deep concern for all the churches. His heart was that of the heart of Jesus through all of the persecution. I want to have that, the, the heart of, of, of a soul. I want to have the heart, of course, of Jesus. Jesus was persecuted more than anyone. And through it all, he stayed true to his father. The question is, can we remain true to our savior through and amid persecutions that we might endure? I want that, but if not faith. I've done messages on this in the past, Bible studies on this. When you read in Daniel chapter 3, these three young men who are facing their lives being threatened, of course, not only threatened, but they are literally thrown into a fiery furnace. Uh, but before this, again, in the threatening of their lives, being burned up in a hot fiery furnace, that of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. What do they say? Uh, let's go to there in Daniel chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 16, and, and of course our, our key words in verse 18 there. But Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 and onward, uh, of course, it gives their Babylonian names here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king after he had threatened them uh, to, to give in and to bow to the, to the graven image, to this idol that he had erected. And it says here, it says, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. And I love these next three words, but if not, I love that faith. That's the faith I want. Lord, I know you're able to save me. I know you're able to bring me through whatever. I know you're able to keep this trial from me and this hardship from me and this difficulty and, and that situation. I know you're able to keep us from all of that. But Lord, but if not, even if you don't, I love this. It says, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. In other words, we will remain true to our God, whether he delivers us or he does not. I love, I love that. That's the faith I want. And we have to be reminded that we have promises that our sufferings and our persecutions that, again, not that we might, not that we could endure. We will endure. That's a promise. You will suffer persecution for Christ. Christ's namesake. We have promises from God's word that this is not in vain. In fact, it says in James chapter one, verses two to four, that my brethren count it all joy mm -hmm. when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, what is it? Patience. patience. My goodness, I need patience. We all need patience. It says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect to complete, lacking nothing. Now tied to that Romans chapter five, verses three and four. I love this as well. And Paul writes, but someone who went through persecution, he knows a little bit about this. He says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character hope. We should count it all joy. We should find it an honor, as Peter would write, to be able to suffer as Christ suffered. Of course, in our humanity and in our carnality and in that sinful nature that we often fight, we don't want those persecutions. We don't want to have to go through them. We don't want to have to experience them. But the question is, can you 
amid those persecutions, as the title says, still remain faithful to God as Paul did, as Stephen did, as the disciples did, as Jesus did to his father. I want to pray, Lord, help my unbelief. Give me the strength. Give me the heart of Jesus. Let me have the faith of Jesus Christ that I may stand confident and persevere to the end. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. It was encouraging. <laughs> Well, my name is John Dinsey. We're now on Wednesday's portion of the lesson, and the title is Caring for the Community. And I'm reading from the lesson. And uh, the early Christian church grew not only because its members preached the gospel, but because they lived the gospel. Believers modeled the ministry of Christ who went about all Galilee, teaching in this, their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases among the people. You cannot go wrong when you do as Jesus did. Praise the Lord. So we see that the early disciples modeled what Jesus did. And, you know, we, we used to have a sign. I don't know why it was taken off. They remodel things. But there was a sign in the lobby that said, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. And you know, that is a very powerful message when you think about it, because really, by the way you live, by the way you talk, by the way you walk even, you are preaching something. Right. May it be the gospel. And so I encourage you to take this into consideration. And you know, uh, Jesus said something to his disciples. I'm going to look it up here in John chapter 13 and verse 34. I know this. I know that... Uh, the following lesson, the following day is going to talk about John 13, 35. So I, I won't go there for you. <laughs> John 13, 34, uh, Jesus says to his disciples, notice this, beautiful. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And this was one of the things that took place among the disciples. They love one another. And it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 44, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, verse 45, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now, I want to stop right there for now because uh, you, uh, sometimes when you read this, some people carry away the message. They just say, well, they sold everything they had. They sold their houses and their possessions and they took the money and they started distributing among each other. No, all things were held in common. If there was a need, uh, they would let the need be known and somebody says, well, I have some land. I'll sell that and let's meet that need. It wasn't that everybody sold everything at the same time. It was as the need arose. Otherwise, everybody would be homeless. Mm -hmm. Everybody would be uh, out in the streets. And so as the need arose is when these things were sold. So verse uh, 45, 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. How? Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Wow! How do we get this done? Well, we need to look at what happened in the book of Acts. They were of one accord. They humbled themselves before the Lord. They confessed their faults to one another and they forgave one another and they prepared themselves to receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was poured out. And notice uh, they were of one accord and they loved each other so much that they went breaking bread from house to house. That is their house. Hey, let's go over to your house. Sure, come over to my house. Mm -hmm. And they broke bread. There was a, a, a love for one another that we need today. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of trouble in this world. And according to this, it says that they had favor with all the people. That means those that were not a part of their group, they had favor among them because the disciples cared for one another, but they also cared for the community. Community, that's why the lesson is entitled Caring for the Community. The community of believers, but also the community, community of those that were not believers. And as they saw the love they had for one another, as they saw these, this love, and by the way they, they, 
they treated one another and treated those that were not among them, they hoped to awaken love in them to find out who is this Jesus that you serve. I want to know him. I need this in my life. Let's go to Acts chapter uh, 40, Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Let me go there first. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, why did I go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 1? Because we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 44 and 45 that they were still in one accord. It happened at Pentecost, and as the time went on, they were still of one accord. And it was a marvelous time, a time that we need today, as I mentioned. Acts, uh, Psalms 133, verse 1. Notice this beautiful scripture. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, more light will go out to the world when the brethren are together in unity. Mm, that's right. This is what the gospel is all about, that people need to understand. Really, we're all related. You know, you have people of different nations and you have different nations because you were born in that nation or that nation. You speak that language, I speak another language. And so people by this even uh, sometimes create cultural divisions and even uh, you even see divisions among people that, uh, oh, you, you like that football team and I like that other football team and there's rivalry even among that. We need to be careful because some of this rivalry, some of this, uh, these things that divide are sneaking into the church through the devil's sneaky ways. Mm -hmm. But as we read, how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We are all family. Mm -hmm. Why can't we get along, we ask? It's because people don't humble themselves before the Lord. Now, let's look at one of the wonderful acts in... Acts chapter 3, verse 6 through 9, miracles were happening. Uh, Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. <laughs> wow, what a command. We need to see this today. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him, saw him walking and praising God. Miracles were happening, and miracles happen when we place ourselves in the hands of the Lord. But you know what? The devil doesn't like unity among God's people. So he tries to bring in problems and divisions. And we have an example of this in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. This is the devil sneaking in. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. This is the New King James Version. If you have a King James Version, it says the Hellenists is the Grecians. Mm -hmm. And these were really Jews that uh, came from what is called the diaspora, that is the... Uh, the time when the people, the Jews that were in Babylon came back to, to Israel. And these were Greek-speaking Jews. And these Greek-speaking Jews began to complain about what was going on. And now we have to be careful when we have a complaint. Why? Because it may be that something is being done unintentionally. And the devil is good at pointing, pointing that out. Did you notice you didn't get as much as the other guy? And you could have complaints. And you have to be careful when you complain and present your case in a loving way, seasoned with salt. Continuing in Acts chapter 6, verse 2, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. 
and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Par, uh, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from, the Anti from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then, then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And notice this, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the mm. faith. Wow. So God brought the solution. The complaint came, but God brought the solution. And when this solution came about, we see that the gospel continued to spread, and even the priests decided to join the Christian faith. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dinsey. You've described the love in the early church, and I'm Daniel Perrin. I have Thursday's lesson, A Legacy of Love. Legacy refers to continuing influence. So go ahead and open your Bible right now to John 13. Just have it ready for when we get there in just a minute. But while you're doing that, uh, if you're listening or if you're watching, go ahead and answer this question out loud. Easy question. What is the central issue? Love or selfishness, all right? Let's try not to overcomplicate this, all right? We can easily discuss this as an abstract concept and thinking about the great controversy, we might think of it in terms of war in heaven or persecution of Christians, but ultimately the central issue, love versus selfishness is incredibly practical and it will be played out, not out there, but right here in my daily lives, in our daily lives, in the home family and in the church family. Love or selfishness, we battle that from childhood, don't we? And I pray that as parents, we can help our children early on to be prepared to be victorious in this. So now let's take that verse and uh, John 13, 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, there it is. John 13 to 17, the whole five chapters there, this is Jesus' final farewell conversation with his disciples. And he does it over an evening conversation. And he takes his time through the evening, speaking slowly, answering questions. This is over a Passover meal, the night before Jesus' crucifixion. So I want you to think about farewells because it helps to give us a picture of what Jesus is saying here. And as we think about that, we, we've all had to say goodbye sometimes. Sometimes. sometimes it's hard and, and it's good because it's hard because we love them so much. Sometimes there's a, a big farewell and it has weight to it because the distance is great or the, the time period is going to be long or we know we're going to drift apart when we separate. So sometimes you, you don't say much for hours and then you linger at the door and then out comes all these words. I don't want to say goodbye. This is not goodbye. Don't forget this. We can't part without saying these words that we have to say to each other. And so this helps us then to see that Jesus' kind of farewell conversation here in John 13, it's final words, it's from the heart. Jesus takes his time and he says things that must be said. Now hear these words again. Go back to verse 33. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, and you can go find where he tells them back, that back in John 7, 33 and 34. But just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. And he'd just given them a demonstration of that in the upper room. And so he now says, as I have loved you, demonstrated to you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. These are the words that Jesus wants ringing in his disciples' ears. You'll remember last words, don't you? Famous last words, love each other. He says, I already told the Jews, the people out there, that they're going to look for me and they're going to need something to see. It's you. They're going to see you. They'll be asking, wasn't there a message of hope? Wasn't there a message of love? Wasn't there a demonstration of the victorious life? Where's the one who caused me to feel by his words and actions that I am loved by God? And they're going to be saying this and looking at you. 
You've been with me the whole time. You've been my disciples. What are they going to see? And this is the legacy aspect of Thursday's lesson right here. To the disciples, Jesus says this, will they see in you the same love that they have seen in me? Or will they say, Jesus is gone. The love's gone. We're his disciples right here, right now, and people want to see Jesus. We have taken Christ's name, Christians. We don't want to take his name in vain. Love is more than just sentimental feelings and, and declaring your affection, impulses that are going to change. Listen to this statement from Sons and Daughters of God, page 101. Love is not simply an impulse, a transitory emotion, dependent upon circumstances. It is a living principle, a permanent power. Amen. Ooh. When compared with this true, sanctified, disciplined affection, the shallow courtesies of the world, the meaningless expression of effusive friendship are as chaff to the wheat. To love as Christ love, me, loved means to manifest unselfishness at all times, listen to this, and in all places by kind words and pleasant looks. It will lead us to sympathize with those whose hearts hunger for sympathy. This is such a simple message. By this, they're going to know that you're my disciples. Not if you're financially blessed, although God helps us to make wise financial decisions. Not if you have a great church website, but that's going to be helpful. You should do that, maybe. Not if you understand and live by the health message, but that's important. Don't throw that out. That's, that's important. Not if you have heart-stirring messages from the pulpit, but you need those too. 1 Corinthians 13, 3, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, persecuted, if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. And I add this here, not even if you obey the law of God perfectly. But God calls us and empowers us to do that. That's not what shows them. Only if, 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 if you love each other, love in the church, love in the home, love overflowing elsewhere. Why would anybody want to enter our church doors if we don't love each other? Hey, we got a real big conflict. Come on in here. I need you on my side, this fight. <laughs> oh. We fight, we gossip, we criticize over all manner of things, decorations in the church, the parking lot, finances, food, and we can keep it under wraps pretty nice and cleanly with our suits and ties and dresses and looking good, but it's simmering. And at the point when we will be called upon to make a demonstration to the world of the love of God overflowing from a renewed heart, it's not going to be there because we've nourished selfishness rather than love. So what can we, what should we, what are we called to do? Isn't it simple? Love each other Amen. as Christ has loved you. That's important. Talk of the love of Christ. Read about the love of Christ. Think about the love of Christ. Meditate on it. Picture it. Think of what he's done for you. Pray about the love of Christ. Imitate the love of Christ. Look for examples around you in the church, in your family of the love of Christ. We very easily turn to those complaints. Look at what she's done wrong. I can't believe he wore that. That message was good, but it could have been a little better. All right. Love. Think about the love of Christ. Look at how, how Jesus was exemplified and described by that person. And then, 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 then you commit by God's grace to love right now. Think of someone, a name in your family who you've got a conflict with. Make this practical and say, Lord, help me to love them as you do. Think of a situation where your natural selfish heart is going to rise up and say, me, me, me. And right now, give that one to Jesus. It's yours. Think of that person who cuts you off in traffic. Oh, how irritating that is. And we can, we can meditate on that for hours. We, we replay that story to others. Today, can you believe that person did this? And think of the words that come to your mind in that situation. Give it to Jesus right now. 
Think of someone that you need to humble yourself before and apologize. Mm -hmm. It's probably a spouse or a child or a, a boss or a church member. And ask God to help you because you don't have the strength for it right now. Think of somebody who's got less than you and you can lighten their burden. Lord, help me to practice love and not selfishness. Philippians 2, 1 to 4, let me read them. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort in love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Let nothing be done in selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. I value you more than me. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. What a beautiful message. I want to live it. May the Lord help us to live it. Love each other. Amen. Wow. Thank Amen. you so much. Yeah. Practical Christianity, love or selfishness. Thank you, Daniel and Pastor Johnny and Ryan and Pastor John. I want to give you each a moment to share a final thought. I say don't measure the life we live on the scales of humanity, but on the scales of divinity because we're going to have difficult times, but the Lord is the one that always delivers us. Second Corinthians 4 verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. God is definitely the deliverer. Amen. You, you read my text. That's the one I was going to read, but I want to continue on to verse 17. It's source. It says, for if this is, goes along with my lesson, again, living faithful amid persecution. Verse 17 in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Amen. Amen. I read to you from Testimonies, volume 5, page 488. This needs to be heard. Let each one who claims to follow Christ esteem himself less and others more. Press together, press together. In union there is strength and victory. In discord and division there is weakness and defeat. Let's press together. Amen. One more text in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14, showing that love is connected to the great controversy. Listen to this. Watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave, be strong. That's great controversy language. Let all that you do be done with love. Love is right there tied in with the great controversy we're involved in. Amen. Amen. A closing quote I want to leave you with, I love this. Our theology is only as good as the love it produces. Mm. That's right. We can keep the Sabbath and we should celebrate the Sabbath. We should obey and walk in obedience to God's commands. We should understand the 2300 day prophecy, but love covers all. Know God and God is love. Join us next week, Light Shines in the Darkness.